without further ado, please welcome Mary Heron. You're, you're often looking at characters where, you know, it, they're not people you exactly want to identify with necessarily, <laughs> no. but there's a fascinating story to be told there and, and, and sort of a paradox about their behavior that you really need to understand. It's interesting. We, we were doing an interview with Hannah Murray, um, who mm -hmm. plays Leslie Van Houten, who's a great actress, very, mm -hmm. very smart woman. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't think the word sympathy is right. Mm -hmm. It's just understanding. And I think that's mm -hmm. right because it's... it's I don't think I'm, I'm trying to do one of these stories to justify anybody's behavior or to, to, to necessarily advocate. I, I just want to tell their story yeah, yeah. and, and, and tell, tell their poor, you know, what happened to them and, and maybe by doing that to understand them better. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, something that the film uh, gets across really well is, is how seductive it, it can be. I mean, it's, it seems like a strange word to use for like a murderous, uh, <laughs> what ultimately turns out to be a, a murderous uh, cult. But, uh, you know, the Manson character has this hold um, and strange charisma, um, mm. and the movie isn't afraid to show that. But I also love that the movie doesn't give itself over to that, which is, seems interesting. That's different, I think, from other movies. Yeah, I mean... One thing that we did want to, and I think that, that was just in Guinevere's script, but I also mm. found that interesting, is, is that Manson was not some sort of avatar of evil. He wasn't, he, he didn't have incredible, in, you know, supernatural powers. He was a very charismatic loser. <laughs> you know, he mm. was a failure, like, like, like most cult leaders. Mm. Are mm -hmm. people, they're not people that hit, like Donald Trump, frankly. I mean, you know, if people want to spend that amount of time manipulating others, it's usually because they're not spending enough time doing, you know, serious work. You know, I, I, I do think that. It's, like yeah, a, yeah. it's a full-time job manipulating other people. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, 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 and you know, if, if you're yeah. really focused on, on achieve, creating something, then, then that you're probably not focused on your followers. Right. I mean, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, Manson... Uh, had grown up in prison. He, uh, if you look at any of the biographies, he had an absolutely hideous childhood, and love, loveless and abandoned and, and abused, and then at 12 goes into the juvenile prison system where he's raped in prison, probably, uh, probably con pretty continuously, and beaten up. And he learns uh, to defend himself through manipulation. And I think by having, like anybody who's grown up in extreme danger, hmm. extremely heightened reflexes, and he's very feral. So when I was talking to Matt Smith about how to play him, mm -hmm. I talked about him as an animal who, who had grown up in fear and danger, and that all his re re instincts are attuned to spotting we weakness in others or danger, or yeah. you know that he's, he's operating co constantly on a kind of visceral Right. Level. Yeah. Um, so, so, so Manson's kind of the monster society made him in some ways. Right. Yeah. And the girls are much more mysterious. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. Uh, I mean, we, we did an interview um, mm -hmm. at the uh, uh, when the movie premiered uh, in Venice, and uh, you know what st still strikes me about the movie is that you're you're not just thinking about this kind of aberrant psychology of this this cult because it's very much in 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 the context of the 60s and what a counterculture that was promising so much mm -hmm. um and then also a mainstream that was promising so much or had been for for years of like mm -hmm. being the perfect you know perfect daughter or being the perfect wife or something mm -hmm. um so this is part of what goes into the stew of how the, the women got to this place i think yeah i mean carlene's um says in her book, which is very interesting, Carlene Faith, who's played by Merritt oh, yeah. Weaver, who's this um, uh, a young academic in her early 30s who's running a prison program uh, for, for in, this, um, in this women's prison in Southern California. And she has a group of feminist colleagues, and they're running a, a prison program. And uh, she said that the thing about um, Leslie and Susan and, 
and Pat is that they were such they were basically good girls. They mm. they did what they were told to do. Mm. They were sort of docile, and that's in a way how they ended up in that place. They were like we think of them of, of women of the early of the late sixties, but really they people are formed by an earlier era, and they they were I guess grew up in sort of the fifties as much as they did the sixties. Mm. Do you know right, what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. And yeah. early sixties. So they they were part of this. Um, this kind of femininity, these feminine ideals. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and he plays upon that because a, a lot of a lot of those ideals is that you don't measure up to them. And then here's Char Charles Manson, <laughs> charming Charles, to tell you, oh no, you're beautiful. And then later, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah. actually, you know, when he says that, things like, "You're beautiful," "You're perfect," uh, you know, that's manipulation, but it's also sort of wonderful. You know, like with your scars, with your flaws, you know, with mm -hmm. everything you don't like about yourself, you're beautiful. Yeah. And so he would make, he would thread in something sort of genuine or some, some little bit of mysticism or Buddhism in with a lot of Charlie crap. You know? yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what's so, uh, that's what's so insidious about it. And, and the movie really gets, really gets that across. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, it's, what's interesting is, is uh, as with a lot of your movies is, is the structure that, that it has um, because you're, you're, you know, you can sort of, I think tell from the trailer already that it's, it's set in two different um, time periods. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that, that's that structure and, and that's, in, that's in the screenplay as well. It's yeah. in the screenplay. Yeah. Um, and one of the interesting things, so the, the, um, the framing device, actually it opened it, I don't want to spoil it for you because you're all <laughs> going to see it. It, it opened, it opens, uh, in 1969, but, um, it then cuts to three years later uh, into the into this women's prison, uh, where um, the three women, uh, Leslie, Susan, and Pat, have been on death row for three years, and then Los Angeles, California, um, abandoned the death penalty, so the prison didn't know what to do with them, because uh, they were now stuck basically life in prison, but they had they were in an isolation unit, uh, because it, it was it was decreed that they could not, they were considered so dangerous, they couldn't mix in with the general prison population. So the prison warden, who was uh, the only prison warden in the California prison system, actually, um, uh, asked the Carlene Faith to, to go and give them adult education classes, as she was doing with the, some of the other prisoners. You know, she was running poetry workshops and all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, there's a great sort of <laughs> culture clash because Carlene is part of the early 70s feminist movement that in many ways I think uh, was a reaction against the the radical poli the radical movements of the late 60s where women were were, were sort of delegated to making coffee and running the mimeograph mm -hmm. machines mm -hmm. and the resentment at the sort of sexism or the chauvinism of 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 a lot of left wing guys you know, was a big inspiration for these, you know, this very vibrant, you know, gung-ho young feminist of the, of the early 70s. So there's Carlene Faith, young, you know, feminist, coming in to meet these three women for whom time has stopped in 1969 after their trial, as soon as when they went into prison. And for them, they're living in, in a completely other world. So they're still living in the world of Charlie. Mm, yeah. Yeah, no, it's yeah, and it's fascinating to go between those two, and and, and yeah, it, when when you're in the prison scenes, it's like all you have are these remnants <laughs> of that past reality, but nothing else to really cling, cling to. Yeah, um, it's very interesting. Actually, since we're just talking about it, maybe it'd be a good yes. moment to to play uh, to play the yeah. clip that we have. If we could play the clip, thanks. So he led Katie away, and I asked Squeaky if Katie was Charlie's old lady, and Squeaky told me. Nobody belongs to anybody here, except Charlie. We all belong to Charlie. I thought that was pretty far out. Then she says, if you're lucky, he'll pick you next. Every girl should have a daddy like Charlie. Something for you to take a look at for next week.
The Bible is the only book Charlie let us have around. Charlie says that authors are evil, trying to play mind tricks on the reader. So do you feel like you'd be doing something bad by studying with me? Because if you are going to do these classes with me, you're going to have to read books. I'm also gonna leave a copy of this. Have any of you read it? This book changed my life. It looks like it could be interesting. Um, and what's also great about about that scene, in contrast to other scenes, are just the, how it's also told visually very much. Just the, the lack of color mm -hmm. in, in the in the prison, um, and and in the in the I'm, I'm sort of painting word pictures here, I guess. <laughs> but but I mean, but I mean, in the in the farm, you have this kind of nice sunshine feel to it. Yes, and I think that was uh, Krilla Forsberg, the the cinematographer, and I. Um, decided really, really early on that the um, ranch scenes would be, that the two p parts of the movie would be shot completely differently. So the, um, um, the ranch scenes are very golden and warm and hand, a lot of handheld and everything very visceral. And, uh, and I said to Krill, I want the, the prison scenes to be very cool, sort of gray blue and very static and sort of different lenses like portrait lens and he says he's Swedish so he says yes Bergman's persona you know <laughs> so so um, we tr I guess we try to shoot it more like Bergman so and in, and in those ones you know it's very still where the faces are, are, are hope, hopefully will be telling you everything and then we actually had a third mode which is the mode for the violence mm -hmm. um, which we I said well I want it like Kubrick <laughs> and we talked about it being just information so just um, and just information was our code for that, which meant uh, very flat and plain and, and sort of mm -hmm. awkward and kind of brutal and just like flat. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I thought this would also be a good time to kind of just talk about some other, other films that, that you've made um, and, and one that comes to mind a little bit uh, uh, you know, I mentioned in the introduction, American Psycho, just because, you know, that's that's a movie that actually was a bit, you know, controversial at the time. I mean, in kind of the wrong ways, I think, mm -hmm. because it's it's you know, but but it was. Uh, it's also you know, it's a movie where you're focusing on this kind of um, psychotic mm -hmm. <laughs> characters that that it's a center, mm -hmm. and violence is part of the 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 language that that the film is 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 using but also you know questioning and, and thinking about um and but that film was very much in, in a satirical mode right yes yes although I don't, I don't know that people got that when it first came out actually <laughs> no it, it's funny yeah. it's funny because i think that people didn't really like it and it wasn't a su success particularly when it came out and i think people really didn't know how to take it because it is un, un, fairly unusual i think in and certainly in american cinema mm -hmm. I don't know because there there are there is a whole like Tarantino does violence and humor, but I, I don't know what it was about this one that it was people found it hard to interpret and didn't. I, I'm saying this because at the premiere at Sundance, people really didn't know how to react, mm -hmm. and there were people hardly anybody was laughing except for our little group <laughs> <laughs> of you know me and, and Christian our editor and everybody because we, we you mm. know we thought it was a lot, I mean not it's not all funny but there are scenes that are clearly for meant sure, to be yeah. funny and and no uh, people were just like is it wrong to laugh you know and, that, and yeah. then once people realized oh I see it is a mixture of sort of black comedy or satire and and yeah. horror then, then I think people liked it a lot more. But, but yeah. sometimes it's hard if you don't know how to, and I, I, I sort of sympathize, because you know, if you don't, don't know how to take something, it, sometimes you have to see it again. You know? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's what's so brilliant about the movie, is that it's on that kind of knife, knife's, knife's edge, and, it's, and it's, it's brutal because, I mean, the kind of power that he, he has in his position mm -hmm. is pretty brutal, um, um, but it's also, he's also ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, and I, th I think the thing is, that's what Christian got that, I think none of the other actors I met with were going to get because he thought it was really funny and and he thought the character was absurd mm -hmm. and that's why he was such a great choice to play it because he wasn't trying to make him cool mm -hmm. and it, it's funny because I, I met with quite a few people and, and especially with the young Americans they, they, there was part of them that wanted him to be cool <laughs> you know in GQ and he's not you know and he's the, the, right. it, it's clear and some of my favorite bits of the book are the sort of dorkier aspects oh, of Bateman yeah. and the ridiculousness of Bateman yeah these kind of long disquisitions on Phil, on Phil Collins yeah Phil yeah. Collins and <laughs> I like Phil Collins <laughs> yes and <laughs> 
and and you know that th that's where he sees sees beauty and depth and um, uh, j just how he behaves in a nightclub. He's very uncool and he's unsure yeah. of himself. And that, in a funny way, not that you're identifying with him, but his insecurity and his mm -hmm. sort of uh, nervousness about everything is something that actually, in a way, does draw you in. Mm. You right. Know? Yeah. He's not a sort of perfect, uh, perfectly cool, uh, you know, style of serial killer. He's, he's really a mess. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, he's a head head case. Yeah, um, no, I mean it's, it's it was also interesting. I mean another thing that's I think interesting to talk about the film now is your I mean your decision to make it then because that was that was a book written I guess it was the late eighties. I'm going to get the uh, around I or was it I early nineties? Early nineties maybe. I read it I think in 1990 or 91. Yeah, I read yeah. it when it came. I was working in London at the BBC and I oh. read it on the way to work. Uh, and it, people would it really people would look at you like <laughs> right <laughs> reading that horrible book. So they moved to the other side of the car. Yes, yeah, because <laughs> it was a big sca a big scandal then. But I mean, w but when in '96, after after my first film appeared uh, uh, at Sundance, um, I got a call from one of the producers, and I had read the book, you know, I, I, and I felt the book was a really misunderstood book, mm -hmm. and that it was actually a lot of it was really brilliant satire. Um, and when I got that call, I thought, oh, just enough time has passed. You could do a film about the 1980s and do it as a period piece. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of start, you know, and then what I said to them at the time is, I don't know if you can make a movie of this book, but, you know, give me some money and I'll write a script and we'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and I think that's one of, one of the especially strong parts of the, the movie is the adaptation aspect of it. I mean, it's very carefully distilling parts of it. Getting rid of stuff that you know, really wouldn't re wouldn't work yeah. at length. Um, yeah. So I I really think it's one of the great adaptations as well. Okay. Um, and yeah, and then that was in two thousand. It's I, it just felt to me like a very good time for it as well because it's kind of funny to remember it now. But like the first dot com boom age when mm. wealth was being worshipped, mm. <laughs> but under the guise of you know tech whiz kids and stuff. Yeah. Um, who now run the world. But anyway, yeah. that's the pocket history of the uh, yes. <laughs> 21st century. Um, but uh, um, I, I also want to go even further back just because I think it's, it's, it's interesting. And I don't know if, if it sounds like a weird c connection, but um, initially uh, uh, you, you worked as, as a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious how that, uh, or whether you think that informs uh, your decisions in terms of what you choose for material. Um. Yes, I think so. Um. I think when I was a journalist and then I, I wrote about rock music, I kind of fell into that just through the sort of punk scene um, and never really intended to be a music journalist and, uh, and was sort of stuck there for a while. But then I, um, I got into uh, first a pop music show. That was my first job in television. I wrote the, I did research for, for stories and I wrote the questions for all the celebrity interviews, which was really fun. Oh, wow. which I have That's to say, great. I thought I did really, yeah, for, you know, <laughs> The you know boy George the pop stars of the early eighties, uh -huh. um, and then <laughs> I got fun. a job on a kind of um, uh, sort of serious arts program. So I, I did mm -hmm. a lot of research, and I do love doing research. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm kind of very attracted to, to real life stories just because I get to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. But then uh, it's ridiculous because you do way too much, <laughs> and and you don't you j you just spend years, and at some point, you just if you're any of you are doing a script based on research, at some point you just have to stop <laughs> it's you know. back away from the yeah 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 you can <laughs> just spend forever doing it <laughs> um and also i think it's interesting i studied literature i didn't go to film school i studied literature at university mm -hmm. um but i've always been interested in literature and history and the I, how, I, people's stories against historical background mm -hmm. and how history informs an individual life the course of that life, as, as all our lives are affected by history. Mm -hmm. And and I think women's, I also interested very much, obviously being a woman in the now 21st century, but growing up in the, the first half of the 20th century, you know, and, and looking at my life versus my mother's life versus my grandmother's life and how, and my daughter's lives and how, my two daughter's lives, and how radically our lives are, have been mm -hmm. affected by the m point at which we were born. Yeah. You know, I don't think yeah. you can consider women's lives without uh, looking at them against history. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, that that's almost the, the structure be 
um, behind I shot Andy Warhol is of trajectories. Yeah. Um, and 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 uh, you know a a, a, a you know, smart a feminist intersection with intersecting with what was like the main story, the main mm -hmm. cultural story, which was Warhol and, mm -hmm. and his and his factor, and what what happens then, and what happens to to what she wants and what she wants to express. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and th and then and then all my characters have their own pathology, and that you know, yeah. and that <laughs> that affects it. So it's not just them For in sure. history. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 a it's those multi, you know. You know, con conjunction of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we can good to get some questions from the audience if uh, anyone has any about Charlie says or past films or yeah. Oh, if, sorry. If you could just wait a second, we we have a mic just so. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I think any kind of apocalyptic time is going to be very open to cults. You know, any, uns any time of great instability, you know, which is what the late 60s was. And, and I think, um, it's funny, I was a producer on this documentary about the Weather Underground, and I, um, which actually I didn't do very much for, but my friend made the doc that doc And I've always been very obsessed with the Weather Underground, mm -hmm. and very fa I'm very f fascinated by political revolutionary cults um, and there was just a time I think partly because of the the sort of horror of Vietnam and the helplessness everyone felt to stop it and the um, you know riots in the streets and everything and I remember because you know I was a teenager then so I remember um, unbelievable changes happening that I can remember from the time I was 10 to 16, like the world completely transforming, culture seeming completely different. So when you get this kind of unbelievably rapid change, and then I think in the case of, um, of the Manson kids, uh, a ton of drugs, you know, they were being given, Charlie was giving them acid almost every day, you know. Mm. So you get a lot of people who, whose yeah. sense of reality is really, really being taken apart. And really, they're also very isolated in a way um, that that you could be then, because you know they're you're, they're off on a ranch, you know, thirty forty miles outside of Los Angeles. There's no, they're not allowed TV or radio, so they're just getting, I think, crazier and crazier. Yeah, that seems unwise. Yeah. <laughs> Although, mind you, I mean, people, yeah. the people, you know, people follow the cults in the middle of cities now with that's, the internet and, yeah, and cell phones. So that I is true. Say that's all that, but yeah, I know that that's sort of interesting with the movie coming out now. It happens to be at a time where like a couple of cults are, are yeah. in, in, in the news. Yeah. Um, any other question? Uh, no. Um, I also wanted to ask just about um, since you had experiences working for, for television mm -hmm. as well and. Mm -hmm. In terms of building characters and developing characters, mm -hmm. what, what's it like having like a, a, a larger episodic canvas, like Thalia's Grace, for example? Um, yeah, that was that. really great, actually. Yeah. I, re I really love doing Thalia's Grace, um, partly because I, I did do all, all six episodes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd done a fair bit of episodic before, but then you're kind of being wheeled in and out, and it's really right. the... Right. Um, you don't get to cast it. You know, you, you're f you're fitting in, understandably, you're fitting in with an existing style. But with Alias Grace, you know, I was with it from start to finish, so it felt, and we shot it out of sequence. We shot it as if it was one very long movie. Oh, so we shot it in, in um, uh, oh God, 65 days, you know, oh, like wow. 11, however many that weeks that is, mm -hmm. um, 12 weeks, no, 13 weeks. And, um, so it was a kind of grueling, but you got, you got, Ellis Grace is like a 19th century novel, and so it sort of unfolds in kind of a leisurely way, and it's very ambiguous, and there's lots of layers, and there's, you know, three different time frames, and it just, um, and it allowed me to work extremely closely with this actress, Sarah Garden, who I love, mm. and, yeah, uh, and was very close to, and, and we formed such a, which I try with all, I think, I think this, I, I'm lucky enough, enough to say this has been true of all the movies, you know, that you form a very close partnership with the mm. lead actor, with all the actors, hopefully, but particularly the leads, particularly in almost everything I've done, um, there's an actor on stage in almost every, you know, mm -hmm. 
on screen in almost every scene, the lead. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, which is even true of Hannah, actually, in this. And you, you have to form this very close rapport where a lot doesn't have to be said. And you can really sort of, if you have this understanding, then you just get to shade the performance and sort of build on it. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's a sort of journey like no other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and is, is that something you think you want to return to doing uh, episodic or are you... Yes, yeah. yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes. I mean, it's it's absolutely the best medium for a novel, for a long novel. Oh, interesting. There's no question. I mean, um, that's it's why it's so hard to bring certain books to the screen because mm-hmm. you just have to lose too much. So, there. I mean, I mean, there are certain things where certain books that lend themselves to it, but anything really complex, mm. in narratively or whatever. Yeah, being able to do a miniseries is, a, you know, I grew up. Um, I spent my teenage years in England, and I grew up with the miniseries. Okay. And for years, I was like saying, well, "Why can't we do it as a miniseries?" You know, <laughs> in American TV. And American TV, no, no, we don't do it in American TV. And suddenly, they've discovered right. it, which is great. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that that whole has, has all been overturned. Yet, yeah. I mean, when I was growing up, the, the the TV movie was like a byword for not something great. But yeah, now, yeah, yeah, something schlocky. Right. Yeah, yeah. But now, but now they're yeah. now they're great. Yeah. Now it's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, a, a question in, in the back. Um, oh, sorry, because we, we end up recording it, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, thanks. I was curious, without giving away the film, so um, the feminist transformation of some of the cult women that were in the cult, like, I didn't realize that that was actually part of it until I watched that clip that they were given those books and then had an opportunity to, did they change their minds at all or was that well, like a thing? Well, then I'm going to give it away. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so but I, but I, th- I, th- I think that there was some, ch- we don't show, show a, 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 the complete road because we end, um, you know, we only show the first sort of year or two of, of Car- and Carlene spent a lot of time with them and remained friends with them really until she died. Um, which was happened, she died just before we, we started filming, sadly. Um, mm-hmm. um, but I think, you know, it's, it was a long road and, the, and, and different effects on, on different ones, of, ones is all I can say. Yeah, I've just never heard you. that angle before, so that was really cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is another, uh, another interesting aspect of the film, is, is, which I, I think has cropped up in other, other work you've done, that you're taking some like star, like something that's going to suck up all the energy in the room, like a famous person, like something mm-hmm. something about fame. But you're kind of going behind that and, and a bit. Well, also I think that it's um, it's very very hard to make um, a film just about a famous person. Mm-hmm. That you have to kind of go go behind the scenes in some way. And there's something about very famous people that they're they're unknowable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, which is true of Charlie. Charlie's unknowable. Warhol's unknowable. Right. I don't know why, but there's just, in some ways, uh, I'm, my new film, uh, which oh, yeah. my husband and I have written, is about the last years of Salvador Dali. Mm-hmm. And John and I were talking about this. I mean, Dali is unknowable, essentially. Yeah. There's just layers and layers and layers, and you'll just never know. Um, and so we have, a, you know, a kind of invented character as a young man who's a studio assistant because you, 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 just, you just can't go at it directly, right. I think. Yeah. You have yeah. to see their effects on others. And yeah. that's the same thing with, with Charlie. There's just no, there's no way of kind of... So someone said to me, you know, what would you ask Charlie if you could meet him? And I said, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to. <laughs> yeah. uh, for a number of reasons. For a number of reasons. <laughs> but also because he would only lie. Right. There'd be, no, there'd be yeah. no communication. There'd be no, there'd be no, they're there. Right, you know? yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. In, in some ways, he's, he's this very uh, sinister animal. In other, in other ways, he's kind of a familiar American type in that he's a con man. Yeah. 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 Total comment. As they yeah. all are, you know. That's mm-hmm. the thing about cult leaders is that they're because, and what's what the mystery though, the sort of enigma of them is. It's not all a con. They must believe some of it to make it work. So what right. are they? Where does what they believe and 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 yet it's clearly not all tr- all sincerity because right. of the you know they're lying to their followers and they're manipulating and then they're l- very often lying about their pasts or or, right, or right. building themselves up to be something they're not 
you know, like the this new cult Nexium, where the guy said he, you know, told his followers that he was the, the smartest person in the world, right. <laughs> which, which they believe, and the most right. moral, which they believed. Right. Um, but but with Charlie, he, you know, he'd built up his great great abilities. Same with you know L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. You know, so, so so there's that that mixture of the con and and yet you you need a spark of sincerity in order to yeah to make it convincing. Yeah, the, I mean, there's I remember reading something about what confidence man means, which is not just that the person trusts you, but that you that it's not that you just trust the comment, but the comment pretends to put their trust in you. You know. Yes. Yes, so, and actually, yeah. you know, what was interesting was um, uh, one of the one of his youngest follower, who we sort of is a character in this girl called Snake, um, wrote a book recently, and she said that when she met Charlie, she felt that he had seen her, the way that nobody had ever seen her, yeah. that he had understood her, and that a lot of people felt that that they were being seen, and who he did manage to have that effect on people. Yeah. Like that gives a new a new spin on the on the idea of feeling seen. It's a yeah. <laughs> little strange. Um, yeah, and I mean a, another interesting thing uh, about about the film is just, I mean we we've talked a little bit about this uh, already, but just just this, the 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 sense that I don't know that they're even aware where the end point of it all is when when they're in the midst of it. Um, it's 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 you know in retrospect thinking about it historically it's like oh well they they got together on on a, on a commune and and this half crazed person is leading them you know where that's going to end up mm -hmm. there but but I think the, the movie also sh shows just how it that was just their life you know and and mm -hmm. at, at the time I um, mean it just kind of swallows swallows them up so it doesn't have that I don't feel like it's a movie that has this like you're just waiting for the hammer to fall you know no and and Whitaker said this. Um, about cults that you know any large group of people living together they, uh, most of your time is is household chores you know right. <laughs> there's meals to cook there's dishes to wash there's there's you know garbage runs in their case you know there's just the life and um, and and that you become very embedded and and it's your family it's your world yeah. you know and yeah. the apocalyptic stuff is sort of a small part of it right. you know i mean it's there but but a lot of it is just your 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 devotion your friendship with each other yeah. and and the the power dynamics, you know, the insecurity of does Charlie approve of me? You know, am I part of this? Am I an outsider? Am I being rejected? Am I being accepted? You yeah. know, that, that keep people going. Yeah, and I I wanted to ask, of course, a, a bit about uh, Guinevere because mm -hmm. I mean she wrote this New Yorker article um, about her own experience. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how how that affected. Um, her. I mean, well, it's funny because because uh, I'd always known, you know, since I've been friends with Guinevere for twenty five years, and you know. I've known about the cult, or she'd ever so often throw in some reference to, <laughs> to the cult, to, to, to the, the commune or the family that she grew up with. Um, and when we were on the set, uh, it was funny because I think it was kind of a throwback. It was must have been very kind of strange for her because you know I took her into the kitchen. I said, "Well, well, how would they organize the food?" You know. And it, Wow. in a commune yeah. and she was like well this, this would go there and there'd be jars of that and you know I think she was kind of somewhat recreating um, uh, the childhood and then uh, in the scene where there's a fight at dinner where Charlie attacks Susan mm -hmm. and she was saying you know was saying what would they do after she said they would just pretend that nothing had happened right. you know so, yeah. so she brought a lot to the table yeah way. which sounds like a lot of Families, actually. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, also, I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. it's like it's also yeah. an abusive family. Abuse, exactly. Yeah, abusive family. Yeah. Um, any other questions uh, here in the second row? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I wonder, did you manage to make this film now, partially because the stories are more welcomed um, in the wake of Me Too? Is there any connection? I don't, you know, we started, like all films, you know, we started, ma Gwyn started writing it probably five years ago, uh, pre Me Too. And, um, and then I signed on to it in 2015. And then I took a year, over a year out to do Alias Grace. And it was actually uh, when Alias Grace was coming out, uh, 2017, that the whole Harvey Weinstein thing happened. Oh, wow. And it actually affected Alias Grace more because, you know, we were just doing the Alias Grace, 19th century story about a right. woman, and suddenly we found ourselves uh, in this world of people suddenly being interested in stories of abused women, you know. 
to, uh, and Margaret Atwood suddenly being cool, you know, is like, uh, <laughs> right. it, was, it was really strange. So that affected that project. Um, and, and that's the thing, you see, things, things take so long to get made. If you're lucky, you start to make it, and then maybe the stars align by the time it actually gets made. But what did happen was in 2000, whenever I heard this, 2016, maybe 2017, I can't remember, um, the news came that Tarantino was making a, a Manson movie, or a movie oh, that right. would feature Manson. So that is actually what really got it made. So I called up the producers, I wrote to them and said, if you don't make this now, you will never make this movie. Right. So yeah. we have our script, our script is written, make it now. Right. You know, because yeah. it's very hard to get a, get a low budget film made, and ours was made for under four million dollars. I think I'm not supposed to allow okay. to say that, but I'll tell you, <laughs> just tell you. Our secret audience. Um, and the podcast. And the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then we, and we shot ours in 20 days. Uh -huh. But oh, I'm looking wow. forward yeah. to Quentin's movie. I'm sure yeah. it's good, you know, and I'm sure it's really interesting, you know, yeah. but his movie is actually, I was never worried because his movie's about, I think his obsession is with Hollywood in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be, yeah. Which is a, a great subject. Yeah. But I knew that I could get this made because we could come out first. And otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, you have so few resources as a small movie these days. I don't have any big stars in my movie. And um, I guess Matt Smith's a rising star, but, you know, it's very hard, to, you know, to get anybody to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, has, is that something that you think it's it's gotten harder since since you started making independent films, or is it, oh, they, they, no. it has it was never, never easy. ever been yeah. easy? I've never yeah. understood it when people say, "Oh, it's the heyday of independent film." It was, it was. I mean, maybe the only film that came right after was American Psycho came right after, but even then, mm -hmm. that was quite a battle getting that made. And then the next. They, they've all been very difficult to get made. I th but that's, yeah. you know, I'm used to it, so it's yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yep. mm -hmm. uh, you've made a lot of works that center around acts of violence. Mm -hmm. um, and while you use a different visual language for a lot of your movies and TV shows, how do you settle upon how the violence is going to be depicted from one work to another? I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't, it's not really conscious. It just, what feels right. I tend, although everyone thinks my work is violent, I tend not to actually show the moment of violence. I, I'm not very interested in, in body horror. It's just a matter of taste, I think. Um, when I was a kid, I mean, the, the things that really influenced me were, um, I really love Polanski, mm -hmm. actually. You're not supposed to say that, but I, I do, and I'm still very influenced by him. Uh, mm -hmm. And Hitchcock, and, and, and Chabral, actually, an actor, uh, a director. People mm. don't talk much about him. Yeah, especially considering he made like 45 movies. He made 45 movies, <laughs> and actually, when I was a teenager, I was a yeah. big, big fan of Chabral. Yeah. So I was always interested in things that were um, suspense rather than actual. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a big horror movie person. Um, so I'm interested in the lead up at, to violence and the aftermath. So even in, I mean, like um, American Psycho, you know, the big sort of axe murder scene, you, you actually don't, I think I very rarely show the moment of death. I think I did mm -hmm. in Alias Grace, actually, because we do show the stress, and we actually should keep replaying that because <laughs> Anna Paquin got strangled like 50 times in one day because we, we do different versions of it. But, um, <laughs> but that was sort of in the script. But, uh, but I, I tend to show the, the build up or the aftermath. But it's yeah. funny because if you make something disturbing, people, I'm always surprised people talk about my movies as being very violent and shocking yeah. and all the rest. And, um, uh, and it's funny because I did, and I've had to, you know, I've been, been attacked for it and all the rest. And it's very funny because I did this show the following with Kevin Bacon, mm -hmm. uh, and which is about serial killers. And that was, I believe, you know, we garroting people with barbed wire and, you know, stabbing people, with, you know, all <laughs> unbelievable sort of level of fun. And it was on TV at nine o'clock at night, you know, nobody said boo. <laughs> I, 
I, I think if it's entertaining and not too realistic, right, yeah. then people are fine with it. Right. I think that's why it tends to be sort of art movies that people get all head up about and, 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 and um, outraged because they yeah. are more real and more disturbing. Right, They're, you're kind of, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like the thing with the psycho shower scene. If you actually watch what's, what's happening, you know. Yeah, yeah there's a, it's actually blood running down a uh, yeah. you know, knife and then blood running down a drain. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, it, and it is very disturbing, but it's, yeah. it's just true. It's disturbing because of what you bring to it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And are there any questions? Um, what bands did you see in London? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what, what bands did you see in London? Oh, when I was writing about music? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I saw a thousand bands because I was reviewing, reviewing concerts. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's funny because I just I just got a letter from somebody. I it was one of the very few people interview, to interview Joy Division, and I actually interviewed Ian Curtis and everybody. And and I didn't really like Joy Division that much. And I had to write a whole <laughs> a whole like mea culpa. I was excruciatingly embarrassed that they were going to reprint this article I wrote. So I had to write a thing saying, I know I'm an idiot. You know, I was very lucky because I got I met everybody and I was friends with the designer who actually they have an, a, a Peter Savile. They have an exhibition of his oh, stuff. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I really loved the look of all that stuff. But Jordan Mission, I didn't really get when I first saw them. And I was saying, well, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't get. You know, I didn't like Fassbinder when I first saw and I didn't like David Lynch when I first, I walked out of a racer head. Which, which actually makes me, you know, so there you go, you know. <laughs> it's all out there now. It's all, yeah, no, I mean, I th honestly, I think, and yeah. I think, you know, I have to always remind myself, sometimes I don't get it, you know, when I first see something. If it's, particularly if it's unfamiliar, it can be, quite yeah there's something uncomfortable or disturbing or it seems boring or you know it's like it doesn't work yeah. and it's also because you're just not attuned to it yet and yeah. i always remind myself of this i mean when people are reviewing my work and i get mm -hmm. you know um most of my films have not apart from the first one have, don't get good reviews at first mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. um you know and then you know certainly american psycho um, people came round eventually. Mm -hmm. It was rotten on Rotten Tomatoes for two years, so oh, boy. <laughs> you know people didn't really didn't like it. Yeah. Most people didn't like it. Phil Comment had a positive review. They had America's a positive Psych. review, <laughs> but, um, but 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 you know if I'm about if I'm sort of getting I can't get on my high horse about it because well look at all the things I didn't get when I first saw them yeah. that I really like now, and it's just sometimes you you take time. Yeah. No. I mean I've I. I, if, yeah, when I'm, if I'm honest, I, that's the same thing happens to me, you know, yeah. it's, and it, most people aren't honest because you're always supposed to have like the definitive opinion all the time, but sometimes it takes a little while to, to absorb things. Yes, and I think yeah. it's very hard to be a critic because I was a yeah. critic. Right, of course. I yeah, was yeah. a critic and sometimes I look back at things and I'm like, oh, what an idiot, you know. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's much easier to, to, to interpret something in retrospect, but, yeah. you know, I like to revisit things just because I don't get them, so. Yeah. I, I don't think... It's a shame because it, there's pressure, there's commercial pressure on everyone. There's pressure on the reviewers meeting a mm -hmm. deadline, especially for, especially hard in festivals. Okay, yeah, forget it. <laughs> I think festival reviews are in some ways the most unreliable because people are seeing so much and they're having to make a judgment. And I've, yeah. it's also that way. I've been on juries, the same thing. You're just mm. seeing so much, yeah. um, and the, and there's pressure on on the on the distributors and the filmmakers. So everything's on on, on pressure to make step, snap judgments, which is a shame because there are certain things, especially if they're unusual or quieter, where the value of them will appear slowly. Yeah, yeah. Just going back to Joy Division for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of curious, what did it sound like? You know, because I, I, you interviewed like the Sex Pistols, right? Yeah, I love the Sex Pistols. Yeah. I love the Sex Pistols. And yeah. I, I loved, I was very good friends with the Gang of Four who were kind of... Terrific, you know, entertaining. And I actually... Yeah. Yeah. Gang Four were actually friends of mine before they had a band because I knew oh. them through. Oh, because they were art schools. Yeah, they were right? art. They were art students. They came, I yeah. tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm affected music history. They came to yeah. stay with me <laughs> in my one room apartment in New York for a month, uh -huh. and I took them out all the time and we, to CBGBs, and we went and saw all this music, and then they went back, and, and they told me they were starting a band. I thought oh, that's, that's gonna be terrible. <laughs> It'll <know>. happen here. <laughs> and uh, and and they started this amazing band, and so yeah. I was seeing them all the time. You know, I was seeing their band and the Mekons and all these other people that were kind of post-punk. Mm -hmm. And I was totally, 
this is the thing when you're not ready to hear something. I was very, very attuned to very fast paced, mm -hmm. kind of stripped down, mm -hmm. um, you know, right. punk and post punk kind of rock and roll. And uh, when I heard Joy Division, I didn't, it sounded very doomy and gloomy and goth to me, mm -hmm. which in some ways it is. And oh, I was sure, not, yeah. I'm not a natural sort of goth person, but. I didn't really, I thought, oh, it's interesting and the lyrics are interesting, but I didn't really I, get what I was supposed to get from it. And then about a, a few months later, I heard uh, Level Tear Us Apart. And I thought, oh, oh, I wish I'd never written what I wrote, you know, because <laughs> I realized, oh, this really is great. Yeah. 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 That seems like an apt uh, song title for us <laughs> in yes. terms of Charlie. Charlie <laughs> says, very, um, but oh, please, yeah, another question, yeah. I don't know if it's a punk rock thing. Well, that is sort of what punk rock was about. That's true. Um, I think that's also a researcher thing. I think that's also a documentary thing. But I think, I think with punk rock, it was about stripping down, actually. And I, I don't think what I got from it, stripping down, I don't like things that are too long, actually. Most movies are too long. Um, and I, and I think there was a kind of unvarnished thing in punk that I really liked. Mm -hmm. and, and I liked also in punk that people just acknowledged their flaws. And I also liked in punk that you showed the nuts and bolts, you know, you, sh you showed all the, ra the ragged edges. You know, you, sh you showed, uh, which I like even in filmmaking, I sort of have a conflict with the DP who wants things too perfect. I like, I love Krilla. Mm -hmm. uh, who shot this because he's kind of more of a cowboy and if it's going to get dark, we'll let it go dark or if you want it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, if it's going to go mm -hmm. to focus on, it, just you want to show some of the the roughness. Yeah. So I think I get that from it too. Yeah, no, definitely in the in the, in the the Manson family, like when they're indoors, there's just kind of like a muzziness, very d domest domestic feel to that feels very real and yeah. all the more disturbing for, for, for yeah. that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, one more question up here, yeah. Hi, uh, how is the research process for this movie? Like, did you get to look at videos, interview people? Oh, yeah. Were this, there like recordings of the interviews? Or? I, no, this is, I mean, this is what's weird because I always thought normally when it's my script and I've written it, I spent years researching and years and watching everything. And I didn't have a chance to do any of that because I basically finished Alias Grace and went straight into production. And so I didn't have time to do all this stuff. I read some of the books. Um, but I didn't read nearly as much as I normally would have, and it was fine. It was made me think, oh, why? <laughs> you know, I wonder if I usually overdo this. I mean, Guinevere had done a huge amount of research. And actually, when I was young, this is a funny start, when I was in my uh, early 20s and I was living in New York, I, I, had a, I, had, I worked freelance for a journalist who wrote for New York Magazine named John Bradshaw, who was Anna Wintour's boyfriend. And he was a great character. I loved him, John Bradshaw. And he, he would uh, uh, get me to just freelance and would pay me in cash, wads <laughs> of cash, to go off and research things for him. And he was doing a series for New York Magazine one, and one of the, where he was doing profiles of people. One of them was Charles Manson. So he said, go and find out everything about Charles Manson and give me lists of fact sheets. So I did that. Yeah. And he said, and call up the prison. <laughs> and see if you can get an interview with Charles Manson. Oh my God. So I called up the prison in Vacaville, California and, and tried to get an interview with Charles Manson. And I talked to the warden and, uh, and he said, no, you can't interview <laughs> Charles Manson. But um, I talked to him and I said, well, you know, about what he was like. And he said, he's very into whales. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a wow. big poster of whales on his prison oh wall, and he just sort of talked about it. We were very into ecology at that point. So I actually had, you know, at that point, read Helter Skelter and read all this. So, so yeah. many years before, I actually had read a lot about the family, <laughs> but failed to get the interview. Whales, wow, okay. So he just wanted to study whales. That's all yes, he wanted, Yes, right? if only, yeah. If only. He, he and Squeaker were big on ecology. <laughs> that, yeah, that's also a weird thing that there's kind of like a, through the looking glass, like they had ecological concerns, which 
are legitimate, but they're they're nuts. So. No, I know. Yes, yeah. but it's fine to go and kill yeah. people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. Well, I think uh, I'm afraid that's all the time I think we have uh, for for the talk. But um, it opens uh, Friday. Charlie says, and, and yeah. Mary Heron, thank you so much. Thanks, and thank you for coming.